Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to all our guests. A couple of housekeeping items. Um, this webinar will be recorded uh, for uh, uh, JCU purposes. Attendees will be asked to ask questions, will be able to ask questions at any point of the webinar through the Q&A function. Q&A function will be at the end of the presentation. Very importantly, there's a satisfaction poll and survey at the end of the webinar. Please do take the time to fill that out. If there are any technical issues, uh, do use the chat button to communicate with the event organizers. So, um, my, for folks who don't know me, my name is Neil Parekh. I'm a partner and head of Asia Pacific for Tikeho Capital. In a prior life, used to be general manager of Asia for National Australia Bank and have been uh, very involved in the growth of JCU. And it's, it's wonderful to see the progress of the university here in Singapore under uh, the leadership of Chris Rudd now. It is truly an honor for me to introduce Professor Sir David Greenway. Professor Sir David Greenway served as Vice Chancellor of the University of Nottingham for almost a decade until 2017, having previously been a pro-Vice Chancellor. A professor of economics, Sir David was the founding director of the Nottingham Center for Research on Globalization and Economic Policy. His research interests are in trade and labor, market adjustment, cross-border investment, and international trade policy. He has published widely in leading journals and has a Google Scholar H index of 70 and an ISI index of 34. He's acted as an advisor to the World Bank, European Commission, and United Nations. Sir David's contributions to professional service include membership of three RAE panels, twice as chair, membership of the Council of ESRC, membership of the Council and Executive of the Royal Economic Society and Chair of the Russell Group of Universities. His contributions to public policy include Chair of the Armed Forces Pay Review Body, various NHS appointments and leading major reviews for government, including of uninsured driving and more recently the way in which doctors are trained in the four countries of the UK. Sir David received a knighthood for his services to higher education and contributions to public policy in 2014 and received the Malaysian public honor of Dato in 2017. He was an award and honorary citizenship of Ningbo, China in 2012, became an honorary freeman of the city of Nottingham in 2017. He holds honorary doctorates from Liverpool, John Moore's University, University of Liverpool, University of Nottingham, Glasgow Caledonian University and University of Western Ontario. Among Sir David's current appointments are member of the Council of the University of Cambridge, member of the Council of the National Institute of Economics and Social Research, and joint managing editor of the World Economy. Again, truly an honor to welcome Professor Sir David Greenway. Over to you, Sir Greenway. Neil, th thank you very much for those uh, generous remarks. And uh, it's, great, it's great to be here and to have you in the, in the chair. Um, I'd also like to thank Chris Rudd. Uh, Chris and I worked very closely when he was a pro vice chancellor at the University of Nottingham and then very closely when he was provost of the University of Nimbo, Nottingham, Nimbo, China. And it's great to see him doing the job that he's doing here at JCUS in, uh, in Singapore. And finally, before I say anything else, uh, I'd like to thank Pinky, Sibal, and Erica Neo for making the arrangements for, for, for this to happen. It's uh, there been many downsides to the pandemic, but um, I think you know, one upside is that these kinds of events have become easier and anything we can do that stimulates, promotes connectivity across countries has to be a, a, a great thing. So let me introduce the, the, the topic I'd like to speak to, if I can have it back up again. 
So my topic is uh, the world economy after after COVID, and that it, it might seem a bit premature, maybe even a bit presumptuous to be talking about such a subject at this point in time, partly because we're not through this pandemic, and partly because there's an awful lot of work to be done before we really do understand the full economic consequences of this shock to the world economy. That does not have a prevent us from speculating about um, what may follow and um, informing those speculations with the way in which the world economy has adjusted to shocks in, in years gone by. So this is the way I'd like to come at the, the topic. I'm going to say a few words by way of context. I'm going to say a few words about pre-COVID trends in the world economy. And you would be forgiven for thinking that that means maybe looking at the last 10 years. I just want to take a quite a deep dive into longer historical trends, just to make a couple of important points about the long term. Then we can look at an area where we can have a degree of confidence. That's to say the immediate impact on GDP and trade in the world economy. Once we get a year or two out, it becomes much more difficult to assess what might or might not happen. And, and, and for me, it's then about um, balancing downside risks, which are perhaps reasons for pessimism against upside risks. And I'll spend a bit of time on those and they may see the questions that, that follow. So here's the context. COVID-19, completely unanticipated and by any um, metric, a, a mega shock to the world economy. Almost 200 million infections reported, more than 4 million fatalities reported. Dif quite a differential public health impact. We know it varies with demography. There's a very clear association between the likelihood of morbidity and mortality with age, for example. Uh, and, and more and more epidemiological evidence is coming through to suggest associations with ethnicity and, and deprivation. Uh, there's certainly a geographical pattern to it, um, certainly when it comes to mortality. So if you look at the deaths per million of the population and take the top 50 countries in the world, 45 of those are in Europe and the Americas. Um, only three are in Asia and the Middle East. And you'll probably know, already know this, Singapore comes in at 198. Um, that's partly due to these factors, demography and geography. It's, it's also, I think, partly due to public awareness and the ability with which governments were able to react with the public consent. And I think for various reasons, not the least of which has been passed respiratory infections like SARS in Asia, um, there was much greater public sensitivity to the risk, I think, in that part of the world than this part of the world. And that differential public health impact was fed through quite clearly to a differential economic impact. Again, it varies by income groups, it varies by geography, uh, and, and is also fashioned by differences in policy responses across different parts of the, the country, countries. So right now, massive research efforts underway to understand the uh, pandemic and its evolution, um, to understand the economic consequences of the pandemic, and indeed to assess the efficacy of alternative public policy interventions. My purpose in this webinar is not to second guess any of that, but rather to reflect on the aggregate short term economic impact and speculate on possible consequences for the world economy. So let's look at pre COVID trends, because when we're thinking about the future, it's always helpful to begin reflecting on the on the past. And in doing that, I'm going to say just a couple of words about the very long run, just show you two frames to make 
two points. And then I'll say something about the, what you think of as the, the long run, the period since 1950, which I think most would agree is a, something of a golden era for trade and growth in the, the world economy. And then I'll look at the very near term, i.e. the global financial crisis and COVID-19. Now, to talk about COVID, this might seem an odd frame to begin with. These are transation trade routes 2,000 years ago. Why did I bother showing you this? Well, to make two points, even 2,000 years ago when there was no rail network, no containerization, no air freight, actually there were quite well-defined trade routes through Asia, and, and many of you will recognize the the one on the top there that runs from Chang'an, modern day Xi'an, to China, all the way through to Petra in modern day Jordan. That of course is the Great Silk Road. And um, there are records of that in the in President Xi's Belt and Road Initiative. And, and I, I could attach to that a similar chart that showed trade routes in the Roman Empire. And the point being that in the, the then known world, there was rather a lot of trade going on, not the scale that we have today, but just remember that globalization goes back a long way. The second long run point I want you to have in your mind as we think about the future is the evolution of economic growth and the evolution of living standards. GDP per capita is an imperfect measure of living standards, but it's it's a, a pretty good first approximation. Now, you all know as well as I do that the data we had 2000 years ago, or 1500 years ago, 1000 years ago, was pretty scanty. Um, nothing like the kind of data sources that we rely upon these days. But Angus Madison and, and others have spent a fair bit of time inferring what GDP and GDP per capita may have looked like in deep history, demographic data, archeological data, anthropological data, genetic data. And, and, and the key point is for 1800 years, GDP per capita was pretty flat. And then something happened in the early 19th century and it's grown exponentially since then. And that something was the first industrial revolution and the innovation and the trade that uh, that was associated with that and you know when we talk about growth later on and reflect on what might happen to growth just having your mind um, the longer term trends in in trade and growth and then the final long-term point I'd like to make is in relation to this table here this is the ratio of trade to GDP. So exports is a proportion of GDP, around 1% in 1820. So notwithstanding the fact that we had fairly extensive trade routes for a couple of thousand years, actually trade as a proportion of GDP was relatively minor, 1%. You can see it grow through the 19th century, um, reaches about 9% 1929, then it goes backwards, goes backwards on the back of the Great Depression. Then through this period of kind of golden age from 1950, it grows very rapidly. Uh, around the turn of the 21st century, we begin to factor in growth and trade, of, trade and services. And we're now at exports as a proportion of GDP on average at about 30%. Clearly, there's a variance around that. Um, in, in Singapore, it'll be much, much higher than that. In the big continental economies like the US and China, it will be lower than that. And here's a, a nice chart that it, it, it explains really what's driven that growth in, in trade. And it's trade costs, or falling trade costs. This is a nice chart put by uh, Richard Baldwin, published in 2017. Trade costs are natural barriers, geography, transportation costs, 
as well as man-made barriers, tariffs, quotas, etc. And for a long period, these have been falling, albeit with some reversals from time to time. There's two big spikes in uh, the 20th century there are and obviously the two world wars, but, but the bottom line is there's been a very steady decline in, in trade costs. That's made the world a smaller place. That's resulted in more trade. And then finally, if you look at this period 1945 to 2014, uh, this chart here just plots the correlation between the growth of income and the growth of trade. Not a perfect correlation, but you, you, you fit a, 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 a you know, line of best fit through that and you've got a, a pretty strong positive correlation between the growth of GDP and the growth of trade. Okay, so that, that's enough by way of kind of scene setting. Now let's begin to think about post-COVID GDP and trade, both in the very near term and then looking a bit further out. First thing to say is, is there's obviously a very high degree of uncertainty about the prospects for trade and growth because this has been a very deep recession across the world economy that's affected almost all, not all, but almost all countries over the last year or so. And I'll show you some numbers in a moment that give you a sense of um, the extent of that recession. But there is a growing consensus among forecasters, IMF, World Bank, um, OECD, et cetera, over what's likely to happen over the next couple of years. Once we go into the medium term, we're in a world of conjecture and outcomes there will depend on the balance of downside and upside risks. And I'll, I'll take you through what I see as the key downside and upside risks. So let's look at the very near term. This is um, IMF, IMF growth forecasts. So 29 and 2020 are actuals. 2021-2022 are forecasts. And there you can see on the top line there, for the world as a whole, uh, 2020, we saw GDP, aggregate GDP, contract by 3.3%. In the advanced economies, almost 5%. Um, you look down that list there, you've got at the bottom end, Australia, relatively, well, less, less affected, minus 2.4% and a very deep recession in the UK, minus 9.9%. And then you look at the forecasts for the advanced economies and all of the forecasters, this is the IMF numbers, but all of the forecasts are predicting a pretty robust bounce back. So 6% across the world as a whole, 5% for the advanced economies as a whole. Uh, the US is 6% plus, um, Singapore, there you see it, 5% plus. So across the advanced economies, a pretty robust recovery in 2021, being maintained in 2022, albeit the numbers aren't quite as, um, quite as healthy. What about emerging and developing countries? Well, overall, minus 2.2, so a bit less than the world average and certainly less than the advanced economies. China actually grew in 2020 by just over 2%. Uh, big contraction in India, minus 8%. The biggest of the ASEAN countries, minus Singapore, minus 3%. But you can again see quite a sharp recession and you can again see a pretty robust recovery in 2021. So what, what this is pointing to is a V-shaped recession rather than a U-shaped recession. And, and, and you know, that's, uh, I, I think we may not have predicted a year or so ago. There were great uh, concerns a year or so ago that we could end up bumping along the, the bottom for a bit, a bit longer. And then if we look specifically since we're in, ASEAN looks specifically at uh, ASEAN, uh, contraction of minus 
3.4% in 2020. Again, variations around that with Vietnam growing almost 3%. And Myanmar showing some growth and the biggest contraction in the Philippines more than 9%. But again, the same pattern as elsewhere with the exception of Myanmar. Look at 2021 forecasts and what you're seeing is a pretty robust recovery. So we're seeing this V-shaped recession again, um, being mirrored world as a whole, advanced economies, emerging and developing economies, and ASEAN specifically. What about trade? This is the most recent forecast from the WTO, the World Trade Organization, it relates to merchandise trade volume. The dotted line there, the, the, the small dotted line at the top, is the trend rate 2011 to 2019. And then the, 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 the bold blue line is actuals. And what you see is it's tracking that trend line up until 2019, 2020, then you get this plunge in world trade. Very, very sharp contraction in world trade last year. Um, what, one of the two biggest contractions in the period since 1950. The other one being in 2009, the year after the, the global financial crisis, when world trade contracted by about uh, 9 or 10%. So short-term prospects look encouraging, don't they? We, we see a sharp recovery in GDP. We see a sharp recovery in, in trade. But the, of course, the, the really big question is, will that be sustained? And how long will it be sustained for? And this is when we get into the realms of speculation and conjecture rather than you know, firm forecasts. So what I'd like to do is spend you know, five minutes or so on downside risks, five minutes or so on upside risks, and then we can uh, sum up that there's plenty of time for, for questions. So down, downside risks, and, and think of these as reasons that might make you more pessimistic than optimistic. And here I've got um, half a dozen or so. Firstly, the debt overhang. Secondly, risks around inflation and financial tightening. Thirdly, the possibility that recovery is protected. Um, Fourthly, trade tensions and trade conflicts. Five, inequality, uneven growth and social unrest, and then climate change driven natural disasters. There's always a risk of further major shocks. And um, I've simply listed there some of the areas where they could come from. And they, they really are in the, the world of speculation. What do I mean by debt overhang? The extent to which there's been fiscal responses to the pandemic has varied across the world economy. The, um, the response has been stronger in uh, OECD countries than in non-OECD countries because quite simply they're richer. So you've seen essentially fiscal stimulus is about 15% of GDP. So this is what that has done. This picture here which was prepared by Martin Wolf at the Financial Times, shows what that's done to sovereign debt. This is on a global level. This is central government debt as a percentage of GDP. And you can see 2020 there, um, that's up at a level that we've not seen since the end of World War II. So in other words, in terms of the, the fiscal pressure that governments have been and there is a consequence of the pandemic, furlough schemes, for example, um, increased public expenditure on, on healthcare in response to the pandemic, uh, et cetera, et cetera, is on the scale of a major global conflict. Less for emerging market economies, you can see there, but that's a big, big debt overhang, and that will have to be managed. Um, 
and managing it takes me on to the second point here, inflation and financial tightening. We've come through a period of very low inflation, which has translated into historically low interest rates. So for example, in the UK here, um, the bank rate that the Bank of England sets is 0.1%. So it's, it's more or less zero. The lowest it's ever been in, since the Bank of England was, was established. At one level, that, that's rather helpful when it comes to public borrowing, because it means that uh, the UK government can get debt away at um, you know, fairly modest interest rates. You know, until recently, it was getting 10 year bonds away at half a percent. Um, there are pressures now building up, partly driven externally by commodity price rises and shortages, and, and, and partly because it's, there's evidence beginning to feed through into the, the wage cycle in a number of economies. So there is an inflation risk. And to give you the, uh, 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 an idea of the impact of that on that debt overhang, let's take the UK case again. Um, if interest rates went up 1%, UK debt servicing would increase by 10 billion pounds, which is the equivalent of about two pence on income tax. So that inflation risk has a dynamic with a debt overhang. It also has a dynamic with potential financial tightening. Because if we saw too rapid a rise in, in interest rates, that would obviously compromise the recovery that's, that's underway and could result in a protracted recovery. And one thing that I think we're worried about many economies, uh, the, the, the after effects of recession what's widely referred to as scarring, the, the impact of unemployment for a period, particularly on, on the young. And the next, um, my downside risk that uh, I want to mention is the possibility of more protectionism, um, heightened trade tensions, more trade conflicts. Historically, trade conflicts have not been a good thing for the, the world economy. You know, that, that period of, of, of deglobalization in the 1930s was in the back of competitive trade policy. It wasn't the only driver, but it was a, it was a big driver. Um, we've seen some trade tensions emerge in recent years, even before the pandemic, if one thinks of the, um, uh, the trade conflicts between the United States and, and China and uh, the United States and the European Union. And, and th there's, there's a real potential for them to uh, do damage to the world economy. Inequality, uneven growth and social unrest, you saw even in the short term, you saw even in the short term that um, that recovery is, that's underway at the moment isn't even across economies. And, um, there's risk within economies of uneven growth. There's risk between economies of uneven growth and risk that that spills over into you know, social disorder of the kind, social unrest of the kind that we've seen in South Africa recently. And then the final two points, I, I simply leave with you. You'll have your own view on the risks associated with climate change driven natural disasters. I think there's there's complete consensus pretty well among scientists that we have a climate change problem. Uh, we're seeing increasing evidence of that in natural disasters at, across the, the world economy. And unless the, you know, the policy response to that becomes more robust quite quickly, then that is gonna become another bigger risk for the world economy. Uh, I simply leave the final point with you, pandemic resurgence, financial crisis, regional disintegration, cyber attacks, military conflict, etc., all possible, but completely unpredictable. That might leave you feeling a bit, uh, a bit depressed and thinking that um, we're not going to see a sustained recovery. But let me balance that with, you know, some comments on upside risks. And I've got seven or eight points to, 
to make here. The first point to make, and we mustn't forget this, is the acceleration of vaccine penetration. So far, there's been about 4 million doses administered. There are 25 countries, more than 60% of their population partially vaccinated, 16 with more than 50% fully vaccinated. And you might say, well, you know, hang on, that's still a pretty small proportion of the adult pop world, global population, and indeed it is. But it is pretty astonishing when you think that 18 months ago, we hadn't sequenced the genome of uh, COVID-19, let alone had scientists working on potential vaccines. And, and there are now three or four that um, have been approved for widespread use and are having an impact in, even against some new strains of the, um, the disease. So seeing that program accelerated is obviously a high priority for all governments. Second point I'd like to make, and, and I've got two frames on this, but I'll just show you one because I'm, I'm conscious that we need to leave time for, for Q&A, is the hard wiring of, of value chains. It, it, you know, trade no longer takes the form largely of finished products being exchanged for finished products. Rather, it's you know very complicated you know value chains that, that result in the finished product, which is exported from a particular country. You, you can uh, you can read at your leisure the um, the aerospace example I put in there, which simply draws atten attention to this extraordinary phenomenon where, in the 1950s, the then workhorse of the Boeing Fleet 707. Only 1% of that was made outside of the United States. Um, in the 2017, when this particular article was written, the 787, 70% was made outside. But here's an even better example, having met, mentioned vaccines. And remember how quickly some of these vaccines were developed and then approved. It's astonishing, really. So here's four. Pfizer, BioNTech, Oxford, AstraZeneca, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson. And look on the right hand side of that panel as you look at it and look at the number of countries. And that's countries, it's not even organizations, because there's many organizations, some of these countries involved in, in the supply chain, manufacturing the initial drug substance, the nanoparticles, the formulation, and the fill and finish before it actually gets into clinics to get into the arms of, of people. And look at the number of countries that are involved in, in this process. And, and my point is that these, these value chains are, are pretty hardwired. And, 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 and you know, that's a, a reason for optimism about, you know, even if there's more by way of trade trade conflict, that, that's a reason to be you know, optimistic about the resilience of world trade. Uh, technology, artificial intelligence, innovation, technology is a, a, a big unknown, but we, we know how it's, it's changed the world in, in recent years in facilitating these value chains. And, and that I think will be um, important going forward. Scope for policy intervention, policy coordination. You know, we saw through the global financial crisis much more policy cooperation than had been for, for quite some time. Indeed, that is probably what averted the collapse in 2000 and autumn 2008. And we've seen a lot of policy coordination, as well as some policy competition, it has to be said, through the, the, the COVID period. Um, but within individual countries, we've seen some quite inventive, innovative policy innovation. And then three other points, potential for, for green growth, which we need obviously to counter climate change pressures, resilience of the world economy, the durability of the multinational agencies. What I mean by resilience of the world economy, 
this isn't all the shocks that have been since 1970, so just the past 50 years. But I've just picked out uh, eight or nine big oil shocks in the, the 1970s. I remember I was an undergraduate when the first oil shock hit in October 1973. And in three months, the price of crude oil quadrupled. Uh, uh, you know, the, the world economy hadn't done a shock like that since the, the Bretton Woods Conference. Uh, 1970s debt crisis, which was predominantly emerging in developing countries rather than um, more recent debt issues with advanced economies. The collapse of the Bretton Woods system, which had held the international financial system together since the end of the Second World War. The collapse of the first attempt at European monetary unification. Disintegration of the USSR. Nobody predicted that. The re-emergence of China. Um, following Deng Xiaoping's uh, initiation of reform and opening up in 1978. At that time, China accounted for 1% of global exports. It now accounts for 12% of global exports. Asian financial crisis, late 1990s. We've seen other public health emergencies like SARS and MERS. And of course, in 2008-9, we had the global financial crisis, the biggest economic shock for the world economy in a century. And, and my point in listing those is to make the point that the world economy recovered, sometimes quickly, sometimes more slowly. And, and that says something about resilience and it says something about um, the enduring role of the international organizations. So let me make some concluding points and then I can hand back to to Neil and we can get into to Q&A. Um, COVID-19, well, once in a century shock, probably the biggest pandemic shock since um, uh, so-called Spanish flu, 1918-1919, which had triggered the deepest recession since World War II and a sharp contraction of trade. Provoked extraordinary scale of policy interventions across um, many economies. We'll likely see a strong recovery in GDP growth 2021 plus 6% and trade growth plus 8%. Short term, the prospects of the world economy are going to depend on really pushing on with the vaccine rollouts. We're in a bit of a race at the moment between getting the vaccines into people's arms and um, the emergence of further, you know, further strains. Um, inflation, financial tightening, debt servicing is a short-term risk as a trade tug, tensions and conflict. medium term prospects, well, they depend on some of these issues that I've spoken about around upside and downside risks, like trade tensions and conflicts, um, and technology, which is a great unknown. Very long term, I'm going to end with a very nice quote that Martin Wolf made in a recent lecture at um, Nottingham, that's been attributed to, to various people. Never make forecasts, especially about the future. Thank you very much. I hope you'll like please this a goodly amount of time for Q&A. Thank you, sir David, you're right on schedule. So really appreciate doing that, but more importantly, even for the high quality presentation that you gave in, in, a, in a short time frame, you gave us a very good view of, um, of a very good synopsis of what we've seen in the recent past and perhaps some uh, inklings of what we may see in the near future. Now, um, the Q&A portal is open. I already see some questions coming through, some high quality questions coming through. So, so David, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, good. What do you think of the effectiveness of zero interest rate policy in the face of inflation risk? Well, zero interest rate policy and, and the, the, the monetary accommodation that's gone with it, um, so-called quantitative easing, I, I think has been helpful rather than unhelpful. At some point that has to come to an end. And I think the, there, there is um, 
a risk around it coming to an abrupt end if 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 the uptick in inflation turns out to be you know steeper than we're all hoping it it it, it will be but i think the intention of the major you know central banks and it's certainly the intention of the fed is not to you know promote rapid interest rate increases but to take it you know in 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 baby steps so that we can if you like escape the pandemic successfully and and allow the recovery that's underway to to take hold so there's risk there but i think that um you know independent central banks and you know most of the the big central banks are independent central banks um you know have the tools to manage that thank you so david we have a question from rodolfo who is watching from das marina city in cavite in philippines and my apologies if i didn't say the name of the city accurately rodolfo but you have a excellent question here which is how can a country avoid huge debt caused by a pandemic especially some countries that cannot sustain the needs of the uh, people and also the stability of the economy i think what he's meaning is cannot balance the needs of the people and also the stability of the economy yeah yeah that that's uh it's a great question and it's a really tricky issue and 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 let me let me start not with that kind of economy to make a, a counterpoint to make a point as rodolfo is implying there's a kind of world of difference between let's say the position that the uk's in um you know public borrowing since the first lockdown has been 380 billion in in you know in a <laughs> in a normal year that can be up to 60 or 70 billion but actually that that debt can be serviced because the uk government can get debt away at reasonable rates of interest so if you take the philippines that's not the case so what 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 tools are available to the to the government uh you know tax and spend it's a it's it's a narrow tax base um that pushes you towards more international support i think because if you if you can't raise sufficient to, to cover what are effectively you know transitory debts associated with managing the pandemic then you need to rely on international support so uh, a lot of difficult things for maybe the bigger economies to contemplate at this point in time because they're managing their own debt they they need to be i think increasing rather than decreasing foreign aid budgets in order to support those economies where um it's more tricky to raise taxes and it's more tricky to cut government expenditure thank you sir david um one of the questions that certainly is top of mind for uh, us in singapore is and this question comes from abhishek bharti who is uh, the big doyen at uh, jcu here in singapore so what is the role of financial resilience planning in sustaining the v-shaped growth in trade dependent economies like singapore when qe ends say in 2022 well i don't know the detail where singapore is is concerned so let me you know answer in the um you know in in more more general terms um i think an economy is where the central bank has credibility let me let me start with that in economies where the central bank has credibility and a reputation for macroprudential monetary management 
I, I think the you know the the exit path is easier to chart because you can make you can make a a kind of la larger number of smaller steps and still retain the confidence of the markets and and you know that's got to be the key thing when it comes to you know reversing QE and it's got to be the key thing when it comes to you know beginning to you know tighten monetary policy so so that would be my observation on that and i think you know singapore is an economy that that has a, a reputation for responsible monetary management so i i, I think i'd be optimistic rather than pessimistic where singapore's concerned Thanks, so David, um, having lived through the 80s, which I presume you did too, uh, I have to ask this question. And this um, is also shared by an anonymous attendee. Um, what can governments do to prevent the 1980s like crisis where there was widespread stagflation? Perhaps you can just give a very quick overview of how you define stagflation, because I've seen a couple of definitions in the recent past. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, if we reference it to the 1980s, we are looking at a period then where we had very rapid inflation alongside um, very high unemployment, which, you know, the world that you and I grew up in, when we, you know, we learned about trade-offs between inflation and unemployment encapsulated in the so-called Phillips curve, that wasn't supposed to happen, was it? That's right. <laughs> and, 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 and it did. We observed it. You know, in the, in the UK, inflation in the 1970s topped out 25%. It seems astonishing. At the same time, it's very high unemployment. Now, I, I think the risks of that are, are actually relatively low, partly because we start from a very different place. Um, you know, the, the, the whole policy architecture is different to what it was in, in the 1970s and in the 1980s. And there's a much greater willingness for you know, governments to, you know, to, to think about policy coordination it, it, you know, in, in, internationally. So I don't think there's a high risk of, of stagflation. I don't know for sure, because none of us knows quite how you know, the pandemic is going to play out over the next couple of years, but I, but I think it's, it's low risk. I think if there was a prospect of rapid acceleration in inflation, you would see, you know, decisive action on the part of central banks quite quickly to, you know, to rein that in. And, and then it's about the right policy mix because decisive action to rein that in would mean a risk of you know, putting pressure on output and unemployment. So then you need to think of more imaginative um, you know, labor market policies and industrial policies that you know, make it easier, for instance, for individuals to acquire skills, make it easier to, you know, for individuals to move from you know, one job to another. So in other words, um, you know, policies that promote labor mobility. Right. Thank you for that. Um, you know, in recent years, we've seen the rapid ascent of uh, China. Um, in your estimate, do you view China superseding the U.S. as a major global economic power? I think there's consensus that the two countries are very similar at this point, or maybe in some sectors, one is way ahead of the other and, the, and vice versa. But um, what do you envisage for the future? So as you say, the, the re-emergence of China has been astonishing. And um, uh, probably in personal power parity terms, its economy is already bigger than the US. And certainly at market prices, it will be bigger sometime over the next, probably in the next decade to 15 
Yes. And and that is moving us towards a, you know, if you like, a more bipolar uh, world. Um, that, that's probably one of the reasons why we're seeing a bit more by way of, you know, trade tensions between these two, you know, global giants. Um, it, it, I think it places a responsibility on both to play leading roles in international institutions in general and the World Trade Organization in particular, because I think both have an interest in the endurance of a rules-based system overseen by the world economy. So the, the, the short answer is yes, I see you know, China superseding the United States economically. Um, that doesn't say that you know, I expect the US to go into economic decline anytime soon. It's a remarkably um, innovative and uh, dynamic economy over the, over the long term. But since we are moving to a more bipolar world, you know, we need to see more engagement between the two for the benefit of the international institutions and, and the world economy more generally. Thank you. We have to ask you this question. What are your insights about Brexit? Particularly the motivation leading to Brexit and its implication to the UK uh, socioeconomic situation, the post COVID era. Wow, what a big question. Um, you know, Bre Brexit was never really about, the, sorry, the vote for Brexit, Brexit was never really about um, whether the majority of those voting for it was a good idea or a bad idea to be part of a broader European Union. I think most of the analysis tells us that. I think economically it's, um, it was a mistake. Um, that's not to say I think the, you know, the European Union's are perfectly functioning, uh, you know, customs union or single market, it isn't. Um, and I think they missed, an, they, the European Union missed an opportunity in their negotiations with the then Prime Minister Cameron to make some accommodations that would avoid, I think would have avoided the referendum and maybe would have avoided the result, but it's happened. And, you know, the UK just has to, get on with it and getting on with it means you know a more independent external trade policy which is why there's an, an awful lot of energy going in at the moment to try and negotiate uh, bilateral trade deals with uh, with different countries um, get on with it in terms of you know thinking about its own um, you know post brexit and industrial policy and and you know which areas government wants to invest in, in, in particular in, in R and D and innovation. You know what the key sectors are. Um, you know get get on with it in finding the right way to cooperate with other members of the EU. Post COVID, I'm not sure things would have been much different in or out. I mean, certainly during the COVID pandemic, there's no doubt in my mind that the UK benefited in vaccine development and approval and rollout by not being part of the European Union. I don't think the, the Commission covered itself in glory with its procurement policy, but you know they're, they're, they're kind of through that now and, and catching up, and that's a good thing. But in, you know, in, in terms of what the UK had has to do outside of Brexit. Uh, I don't think that's much affected one way or other by COVID. Neil, I've, I've lost, I can't hear you. Sorry, uh, I was on mute, so my apologies. Um, and this is a question, add-on question for myself. Um, do you envisage the UK splitting with Scotland and perhaps Northern Ireland going their own way 
and sticking and wanting to get back in the EU, um, keeping in mind that Brexit is done and they're clearly, yeah. Nicola Sturgeon has already asked for a second referendum. Northern Ireland and uh, the Republic of Ireland have their own issues, but they seem to like to keep the borders totally porous, which obviously would not be possible if Northern Ireland stayed outside the EU and the Republic of Ireland stayed within the EU. So again, from your vantage point, how do you envisage, say, the next 20 years in terms of keeping the UK together? So if we take Northern Ireland, first of all, um, you know, there are issues, you know, around the Northern Ireland protocol um, and, and, and they're stoking some tensions. But it was always part of the Good Friday Agreement that, you know, with, with the consent of all communities in Northern Ireland, there, there could be a vote on being part of the island of Ireland. So since your time frame is 20 years, do I think a vote could take place within that 20 years? Yes, I do. Just because of the, you know, the way that the, the demographics are, are, are going. Um, what would the outcome of that vote be? Well, that depends on you know, what happens to the UK and what happens indeed to the EU over that period. Scotland's trickier. There was a referendum in 2014. It was a fairly clear result. Um, First Minister in Scotland is pushing for a, a second vote on the grounds that you know the world has changed as a consequence of Brexit and the majority of Scots voted to remain part of the EU. Um, right now, it's pr the, 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 the pollsters would tell you it's, it's too close to call. Um, and for that reason, I don't think the First Minister would like a referendum this year, nor indeed with the Prime Minister, because it is too yeah. close to call. It's too close uh, to call, and you don't want to take a chance when there's so many other things going on. Exactly so, exactly so. Um, but could there be one in a few years' time? There could be. Um, which way would it go? I'm not sure, actually. I'm not sure. You know, the... It would be a big, big step. Um, and I've yet to make the economic case for it. Yep. Thank you. Um, a question from a famous citizen of Singapore, Raymond Puck. Uh, going forward, once the economy in most countries are recovering, I can't see any way for government not to raise tax where the GST and capital gains tax plus inheritance tax, as mentioned by the MAS, the central bank in Singapore yesterday. Can you advise whether there are other alternatives to recapture money spent during the COVID-19 impact? I'm saying, I think he's talking from a government standpoint. Yeah. Uh, no, I think that's spot on. It's, um, you know, you either have to, you know, borrow and you've then got a debt service obligation or you have to increase taxes um, or cut government expenditure. And it's gonna be, you know, pretty tricky balancing act for, you know, for many, many governments. And, 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 and it, it may well be that, um, you know, some things that have been regarded as, if you like, out of scope, have to come into scope. You know, if I, if I think, for example, of the UK position, um, I don't see how the government can avoid you know, beginning to raise taxes. And in my view, it needs to think seriously about going into areas which historically governments have been reluctant to consider, like inheritance tax, um, like, um, you know, tax breaks for pensions, etc. But no, uh, there's got to be some increase. There has taxes. to be an, a way to increase taxes without killing the economy. Yep. That's what he said. Yeah. Right. Um, a broader question for you. What is the opportunity for international trade on this, uh, in the post-pandemic world? And um, 
a follow-on question, if I can just ask it together, is what government policies can help resolve the rising costs of shipping, which is hurting global trade? I think if I take the second one first, Neil, uh, that seems to me to be a short-term you know, phenomenon. Um, that has to do with um, demand and supply is what you're saying. Yeah, supply. yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's a short-term phenomenon, and 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 I I think you know we've seen a trend. I showed you generic trade costs there in that chart okay. earlier on. Of course, a big part of that has been the containerization revolution, and and what that did to shipping costs. So so I don't see that as a trend. Um, change in, in costs, I see it as just a, a, a blip that will, that will reverse. Um, now the first part, remind me of the first part of the question. The first part was, uh, you know, what can be done broadly to increase international trade in the post-pandemic yeah. world? I think it's as simple as keeping borders open. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's that simple. Um, Especially in a world where you know we've seen an acceleration, haven't we, in the development of the digital economy through the pandemic, and 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 you know that's been a good thing as well, and and that will facilitate further facilitate international transactions, in probably in a way in ways that none of us imagined quite yet, um, and and they're much. And, and that'll be much more difficult for governments to intervene and and stop and and that's a good thing so 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 the, so the the key thing is you know avoiding getting sucked into thinking that part of the solution is to close our borders because history tells us that's not part of the solution right um, perhaps on the same subject, an add-on question. This comes from Sia Rifa Anya. Uh, I hope I said that right. Do we need a uniform international policy to avoid crippling effect of global pandemic in the near future, as well as a more robust climate change policy? So the, you know, the. Um... It's hard to think of ways in which you could put enforceable rules in on the first, because the you know the first is a is a, is a public health issue, and 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 what's behind the question is of course that there are spillovers here. That if, if it's because of the uh, contagion, if it starts in one country, it can very easily through people movements and you know spread to others, but. But short of closing borders, which we've done during this pandemic, you you, you know you, you you can't think of ways in which you can get international obligations in place. I think, but the public health experts may think differently. I think on the climate front, it's it's a bit easier. That's about more uh, countries making credible commitments on a credible time frame to move to net zero. Um, and, and, and not simply saying, well, you know, technology will come along and rescue us at some point. Technology will be part of the solution. I, I absolutely don't doubt that. And there's a lot of innovation in, in green technology taking place in, in many countries. But, you know, governments have got to do a bit more, A, by way of changing expectations, because we have to change our behaviors if net zero targets are gonna be hit. Um, but governments have also demonstrably got to act in terms of investment in you know, new technologies, in terms of investment in uh, alternative energy sources and so on. And there's a big opportunity, of course, coming up in to, to reaffirm and renew commitments with COP26 in, uh, in Glasgow in November of this year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So David, as a 
add on question to, to that. This is coming from Shelly Wang. Do you think green growth opportunities are more relevant for developed countries rather than developing countries? I think they're probably easier, if, if I can put it that way, because you know, with, with a developed economy, you, you, you're very often working with a legacy technology and legacy systems. So part of the problem is getting rid of those legacy systems and the consequences associated with that in order to you know, put new ones in, in place. Whereas in emerging economies, you can often start with the new technology. You know, th th a nice analogy is think of, you know, think of um, telecommunications. You and I grew up in a world where it was all hardwired and phones, telephones hung off walls. And you can only you can only have the call for as long as the cable went. And we put up these, you know, big um, uh, telephone masts that took the messages along cables. Well, actually, you don't need that technology. You start with the new technology. So I, I think that there has to be real potential there with with green technologies that you you know rather than investing in coal-fired power stations or um, gas-fired power stations, you actually start with solar, or you start with wind, or you start with, um, you know, heat pumps. So I, I think there are more opportunities to, to change more quickly, if you can put it that way. Right. Uh, I have a question here from a man who's very well known on the JCU campus, Andrew Chu. Do you think there will be a repeat of what happened with the Spanish flu, which was followed by the Roaring Twenties and then the Great Depression? He's talking of the yo-yo that they went through in uh, the beginning or in the early well, part of the 20th century. Well, you, you kind of hope for the first and wish against the second, don't you? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> that uh, you know we are going to you know we are going to see a, a, a robust recovery that just that doesn't just last a, a year, and that, you know, that's possible. There's been and you know the recovery is demand led, isn't it? Because there's a lot of pent up expenditure now that people are getting the opportunity to spend it. They're spending it. Um, but in, in all seriousness, I I, I, I think we have learned a lot. Um, we learned a lot from the 1930s. We've learned a lot from financial crises since then to make me believe that you know, policymakers would intervene in the right kind of ways to avoid anything that approximated the, the Great Depression. So yes, a bit of a, you know, maybe a bit of a party time coming up. And that's a good thing. But Let's hope it doesn't overheat so much that we see a crash. Yeah, party time with some steroids from the various central banks as well as uh, some cannabis. Yeah, why not? Um, hopefully, it doesn't lead us all into trouble in the future. So, David, how open are you to chatting a little bit about cryptocurrencies for a couple of minutes? If you're not, there are plenty of other questions, and I understand. Yeah. I would be just off comfortable ground in talking about cryptocurrencies because I'm, I'm just not um, sufficiently informed or expert to to comment. But you know, if there's, I get that, no, I get that. I mean, um, if, if, why don't you take the the question? <laughs> well, I'm going to ask you the question, and I'll try and help you answer the question if I have a clue of the answer, but. Uh, this is from Jose Antonio Santos Domingos and Daniel Quek and a couple of others who are anonymous, but the basic question is the basic premise of the question is the same, which is how do you see the role as well as the increasing adoption of cryptocurrencies as an alternative to fiat currencies? I don't know is the, is the short answer. Well, we'll, so, we'll get you back next year if Chris Rod will allow us. And that'll be <laughs> question number one next year. 
Right. Um, I don't, um, we have taken 20 plus questions, uh, Sir David, and that's fantastic. I have one last one for you, which I wanted to ask, and I'm searching for it because, uh, yes. So this is a question that is near and dear for folks here in Singapore, and I'm assuming you're familiar with the RCEP. Yeah. The lethal common economic. Okay. So in your view, will it lead to shift of power? in the Asia Pacific region, keeping in mind that you have ASEAN, but you also have uh, China and Japan and uh, South Korea in it, as well as Australia and New Zealand. So you have some yep. countries with some strength uh, in their respective areas. And of course, you've got the big, uh, two big economies in the region in this our set, which are clearly China and, um, and uh, Japan with uh, Indonesia and Australia following. So what's, what's your view of our side? So that's a, it's a pretty big and uh, potentially pretty powerful block. You know, that's what, 30% of the world's population, almost 30% of its GDP across those 15 members. Um, and um, I saw some a piece by McKinsey that was suggesting that uh, it could add about 0.2% uh, um, to the global GDP. Growth. Yep. To GDP. Yep. So it's potentially pretty powerful. Um, what, what, what are my caveats? Well, only that it has to be ratified by all countries and that, um, you know, it, it, it has to deliver. Now, I, I say that because we've seen many, many free trade areas and many cooperation areas where the, you know, on paper it's a free trade area, but then you look at the list of exemptions and the list of exemptions can be quite long because each and every member has its own exemptions. So if it was a genuinely free trade area, that would be a pretty powerful trading block. So what are you saying is the jury is out, but has tremendous potential. Tremendous if potential. All the members get their act together. Tremendous potential. And, you know, we're already seeing a, a, a shift in the center of the economic center of gravity uh, to Asia. You know, that's well, that shift is well underway. And uh, this is an agreement that could accelerate that. Right. I think we are full up on time. Actually, we've gone over. So in 32 minutes, Sir David, I think you covered probably 32 questions. So I started off by saying it is an honor to host you. I'll end it by saying it is an honor and a true pleasure to have you here and I hope to have you again in the near future. And uh, unfortunately, this is virtual, but on behalf of all the attendees, I'm going to give you a round of applause and a big thank you for joining us today. Also, a big thank you for all the attendees. Uh, one request is there is a satisfaction survey that has just popped up on the screen. I would strongly recommend if you could spend just a few seconds and answer that and uh, share that with us. And uh, to all of you, a big thank you on a, on a, on a Friday evening here in Asia and uh, have a fantastic weekend. And uh, Sir David, have a good Friday as well as uh, a fantastic weekend and hope to see you soon, hopefully physically in Singapore. Neil, thank you for cheering that so expertly. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to be part of it. And um, yep, as and when travel is permitted, it would be great to visit Singapore again. Love to host you for lunch at some point and pick your brain. Thank you. Free economics lesson in 30 minutes. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.